Welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast, where with each episode, we hear from different women experts in the health IT industry. We like to hear about what makes them tick, how they overcome challenges, work they're proud of, advice they would give to other women in health IT, and much more. I'm Joy Rios. And I'm Robin Roberts. Today, we're speaking with Janae Sharp, who's on the Utah HIMSS Board of Directors and also started the Sharp Index. Here, Janae discusses her journey into health IT by way of accounting and how her personal story as a suicide loss survivor is shaping her most recent work. She has started a nonprofit and is working to bring attention to physician suicide and physician burnout. You know, Janae, healthcare and health IT is a, it's just a huge world, right? And it's like a million piece puzzle. And we know our piece of the healthcare puzzle. Tell us a little bit about your background and your piece of the health IT puzzle today. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, yeah, healthcare IT is huge. And I, I really like it. I've been involved in healthcare IT for several years. And what I do right now is I'm involved on the Utah Hymns Board. And I'm involved in a nonprofit that we started to help reduce physician burnout and suicide. And those are the things I'm excited about now, how healthcare IT can be improved and how it can enable a better care delivery process. Um, I mean, I have a long history there. I've, I've also been involved a lot in healthcare IT marketing and messaging to help facilitate connections. I actually got started in healthcare IT with a company that did patient reminders and patient messaging and also marketing for healthcare practices. And my husband was a physician, so I knew a lot about the, you know, the healthcare atmosphere. And then I had also done a lot of online marketing for for my own little Etsy shop. And um, (laughs) so I was pretty good at helping all of the physicians practices understand the importance of like branding and awareness. And I really liked working with plastic surgeons and dermatologists, people who understood the value of quality and the importance of messaging to, to your patients as a driver of better profit and better value. Um, and then at that company, I moved up several times. Once because since I was good at dealing with doctors, when doctors wanted to cancel, I was really good at at helping. So it was um it was saves or retention. And not very many women work in that field. But I was also at the time very interested in startups and working on the side on those and also interested in learning more about um product development and integrations. So I was able to learn a lot while I was there. And that was actually the company where I went to my first HIMS, which was a patient engagement summit that had nothing to do with my job, really, like in all fairness. But I convinced the company that I should go and, and HIMS, and it was a great experience. And I continued to decide I was going to, to work in that and got connected with writers, just decided to establish my personal views a little bit more because I was so excited about, about learning and about, you know, figuring out data exchange and integrations as a side interest that I kept working on it. And then John died and I couldn't do the high volume. By that, by that point I had moved up to like a sales position and I couldn't do the high volume sales anymore. It was just, um, it was, I mean, I don't know how much, if you've worked in sales, but like for me, it was just like, you couldn't always be on. And probably did what you know I shouldn't have done and just kind of fell apart and took time off but I had already established a lot of relationships with people through writing and I cared a lot about patient engagement so I was able to keep keep doing that and strengthen some of my relationships in the health IT marketing world and also um, with data integrations like doing side projects customizing EHRs and stuff like that. Um, But I also at that time realized I was sort of angry about the response 
to John's death because I felt like, I felt like, first of all, there was like no room for me. It was just like, just get over it and survive. And I also felt like it didn't have the same reception that a death of cancer had or, or a different type of death. And that was really frustrating because I felt like people just wanted to sweep it under the rug and I got frustrated. And I also got really curious about root causes, like what caused this, what could we have done better and did a bunch of research and decided to try to add to the good after several years, um, decided to start sharing my story more. And it's been really interesting, you know, it's been interesting too, because of my background, you know, learning more about integrations and data and educating myself and taking classes in, you know, health IT code. Um, Cause this nonprofit is different than the, um, like the marketing PR stuff that I'm good at, but it's also related. So I would I have a non-traditional trajectory, you know? It sounds like it. And can we pause for a second? I, ha I have a couple questions. Sure. And Well, yeah. So one is I'd love to hear how your experience has been because I, when you, when you're talking about being a salesperson um, and going through something that's causing you a lot of grief, I can absolutely relate to that because of that need of always needing to be on and when something is going on in your life that just is completely disruptive and new it's really hard to maintain that space you know that public face facing face of like everything's great let's yeah. you know talk about what is so I wanted to one ask you about you know a little bit more about how you dealt with that and it sounds like it, it was a little bit in the retreat and sort of like taking some space yeah. Um, but I'm also so, interested in hearing about like the support for spouses. So, you know, when something happens in your family or to your, in your case with your husband, what, where did you go and what kind of support was there for folks that have been in your shoes? So I, I get it. That's a two part question. I think, yeah, I think it's very relatable that we all go through things in our personal life that are super they, they might just be a big change, like having an infant or getting divorced, something like that, where people don't really know, don't really talk about it. Um, and like, yeah, I did just retreat, like in all fairness, like the week after he died, I probably was in my closet the whole time. I, I just don't even remember it. It was a haze and, um, it was just really dark and a lot of the support that's available seemed impossible for me. Like I was supposed to take my kids to counseling twice a week and somehow I'll come to like this, like group counseling and all these other things that, you know, they recommend you do. And it just seemed impossible. Like the full-time job just to get counseling for your children. And um, I have to remember the second part of the question. And I, didn't really want to lose like all credibility but at the same time like my feelings were so back and forth like so intense I, I would describe it as like you feel like everything at once like you're just overwhelmed um so I did I, I probably said things that that I don't know that I really mean now but at the time like I really meant it like I remember once getting involved with an online community for suicide prevention that actually they were really supportive and they would have weekly chats and one week they were talking about the support that exists like oh yeah there's so much stuff and I'm like that is bs like there's nothing and they're like no it does I'm like look I'm sorry <laughs> but you're living in the fantasy world like if you have to plan a funeral and take care of children like you don't have time for your bullshit suicide prevention and survivor survivor classes and um <laughs> that was really direct like I was really direct in being like none of this stuff none of these supports that you guys have are accessible um like they just aren't if you're trying to continue working and I kind of think emotional support 
a lot of it's the same way. No one really knows how to provide the support and it's not always very accessible. Like my family, they don't know how to deal with this. This is a super traumatic death and they just kind of, since it's so big, they just want it to go away. But as a lost survivor, you're not in a place where it can go away. Um, so for me, it was a pretty big gap. And the school didn't even reach out to like his classmates to provide support. So I was pretty upset, like his medical school and other people. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of things happened. A lot, a lot of people came and helped and showed up. Like they literally would just show up. They wouldn't ask me like, what can we do to help? They would just show up and help. And those are the people that, those were usually people who had been through something traumatic. And they understood to just show up. But um, a lot of the things that are out there are not as accessible as people think. So I have a question. You said no one in the medical community reached out. And just through reading, never having gone through anything as tangible as exactly those circumstances, Janae, I've read that in the medical well, community, you know, mental health is pretty stigmatized, right? Like these, these physicians, yeah. despite being in intensive training, dealing with some of the most stressful jobs in our country, it's like it doesn't apply to them somehow. Do you feel like the medical community not reaching out or his peers or maybe others, do you think that's just symptomatic and an extension of kind of, I guess, what I've read about? Was that your experience? And how does the SHARP index in your work now, how is that going to shape other resources possibly or for other physicians moving forward in this huge conversation around burnout in the increased numbers we're seeing in physician suicide? Um, okay, that's a lot of questions. I'll try to answer all of them. I think some people like express condolences. Some people, a lot of people, what they said was, oh, we had no idea. Um, and they were shocked. And I kind of think the medical culture does does have that where you don't want to be the person who's the crazy doctor. You don't want, you know, in quotes, I, I say that, like you don't want to be the person who can't hack it. Even younger doctors are criticized for not having residency hours that are as long because the job is so big. They, they're, they're required to learn so much that it just takes a ton of time. Um, but you also have this culture of silence, like you talked about, like, you don't want to be the one who complains. And part of what I view my role as, like in the Sharp Index, is saying, yeah, but these things exist anyway, even if you don't want to be the one. That way they're not singling out an individual doctor for speaking up. I already had the loss, like it already happened. So it's easier to bridge the gap than with someone who's struggling and considering, you know, quitting or considering suicide, their barrier to even being honest about where they're at is a lot higher than someone who's already had a loss. So I think it's important for survivors to speak up. Although and the tools that, that I'm focused on and like what the nonprofit is focused on is in preventing burnout and preventing suicide, not necessarily, um, you know, providing support to lost survivors, if that makes sense. Um, we want to, we want to do the best we can to improve the conversations. Like if you can get a really good snapshot of the actual mental health of physicians in your healthcare organization, that is important for decision makers, but it's also important for, physicians to have access to tools for mental health and that aren't being tracked by their employer, that aren't going to be tracked back to them because the stigma means you're going, not going to be as honest. And I think about it too, like most jobs where you work, if you were legit having like a breakdown where you didn't think you could perform your job, you wouldn't tell your boss, like, because you might need that job to survive, you know, <laughs> like, um, and healthcare is the same way. Like these people need the job. They've invested more education than almost any other profession and they've invested a lot of money. So if they had 
you know, a mental health status that meant they couldn't perform their job, they would probably try to cover that up because there was too much at stake. And that culture of not wanting to be the one who fails, but also the high stakes of healthcare, both in your personal investment and the nature of your work, mean it's a lot harder. So, so it's, it's a pretty big challenge. And that's part of why we do, we do some things, you know, but I don't pretend to have all the answers and I don't pretend to be like the one solution. I love that you hit on conversation because as I'm following you on social media, you are having the conversations and it's certainly not an easy one to have, even not being a stakeholder in this discussion or is intimately acquainted with the subject matter. Watching you have the conversation to create almost a consortium of voices, Janae, has been really inspiring and to get to the right questions. And more importantly, as you even mentioned as recently today, how do you measure these things? Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard to know exactly how to measure it. And I've talked to a lot of people online when they talk about even percentages of burnout or percentages of doctors that are at risk of suicide. No one really agrees on the statistics. And online, I've had like great, great conversations. Like the other day, being anytime within the last month, um, someone was mentioning that they didn't buy the statistics that physicians who were burned out or physicians that were at risk of suicide had worse outcomes for patients, which is a popular narrative right now. And she said she just questioned it. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was something that people question. And she shared, um, she shared the documents, like she shared studies both ways. So for everything that people say about mental health and about physician burnout, it seems like there are studies that go both ways. So for me, the conversations allow for quicker access. Like if I need to access something, it's unique that I can tweet it and probably get faster and more relevant answers than if I, than if I searched for it or tried to research it on my own. And, and they are hard conversations, but even, even just the other day, I was like talking to a large healthcare organization who wanted suggestions and I felt like the suggestions I gave them weren't complete. So I just asked for something online to get more ideas. And, um, and it's been such a good resource for me. And also after John died and I was really struggling, it was the people who had been through suicide loss online that really helped me. Um, Even just hearing their stories made such a big difference for me that I wanted to make sure that other people could access care, you know, and access just other, other survivors who understood. So I feel like it's part of our duty. Like if I really wanted it to be better, then I need to be part of that as, as well, instead of just hiding and feeling bad that things aren't better. And that's such a hard place to come from is to be open and vulnerable in a way in in a public setting. Yeah. I think that we all, we can all struggle with that. Yeah. I've always told people like, I feel like I'm the non-example of like what to do in grief. Like I was just a mess. It was like a a swear word and an explosion. And then like, (laughs) like a collapse, you know, and, (laughs) and people watching that, they want like an inspirational story where after you've had this loss, you've created like a better world than ever. And for me, like this whole thing isn't an inspirational story. It's someone who isn't perfect trying to survive, but also there will always be that hole. And I try to try to focus on that. Even as people say lots of positive things, you've done lots of things, you can't undo the bad that's happened. And I think it's important for people to be out there that aren't necessarily like the hero of the story. Like I don't consider, I'm not a hero. I'm just like a mom who's trying to raise three kids with no dad. And that means I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not, you know, I'm not just like an academic researcher either. I'm someone who has a stake in this, but I'm definitely not perfect. And I definitely swear. (laughs) join the club we do too 
I was always frustrated because everyone's like, oh, I was depressed and now I'm not. And I'm like, well, it doesn't help you when you're in the middle of a crisis and everyone's like, don't worry, because in a year you'll be better. Like we need things to be safe for people to talk about when they aren't past the crisis. Yeah, life doesn't, life isn't that nice and neat. You know, we don't all live in a, as they say, like a 30 minute episode that it's all going to wrap up and you can have your conclusion at the end of, (laughs) at the end of the show. It doesn't work like that. Right. Life is messy. It's not all an inspirational story. Like, I feel like people want it to be like an inspirational story where at the end of the book, it's all happy. Instead of at the end of the book, it's like a, Like, oops, sorry, you just read this old book. <laughs> oh, well. Well, you have, I mean, I mean, you've been on a journey, and um, I'm not sure how many years it's been since John passed, but you have a new member of your family, can, and you, as you were saying, you brought um, your baby to him. Can you speak a little bit about balancing this new chapter of your life? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited. Like I have the sweetest baby. First of all, I have the sweetest baby. Um, it's been three and a half years, um, since John passed and, and Naveen was born in November and he came to hymns with me and a nanny came. He doesn't take a bottle and he also doesn't take a binky much to the consternation of the woman who flew out with me or next to me on the plane. <laughs> and I just decided to bring him Um, and it was a little bit harder than I thought it would be to be honest Um, because I I hadn't really left the house a ton a lot of what I do is writing about health IT and um, you can do that really easily with an infant at home and um, I decided to come and he's so he's such a wonderful baby and my kids love him so much like everybody loves him because he's just so nice. I don't know if you saw him, but like he was struggling at hymns because it was so overwhelming and there were so many people and that's just not his aesthetic. Like he's a baby. Um, and I felt really lucky to be able to bring him. I still remember like sitting in the mother's lounge with him. There was only one room, which I'm happy that there was a room at all. And there were women in there pumping. There were like seven of us and I was feeding my baby and they were just sad that their babies couldn't be there. And I just remember them being like, I'm jealous that I can't be with my baby. And I have a ton of respect for people who, who work and have a child because it's a lot of work and it's pretty hard. And so I was happy that I was able to bring him, but also I, it took a lot of planning, like bringing in a nanny, bringing back up. She had to do a couple things during the week. And so I knew I would watch him. And, and those times were like an explosion, you know, <laughs> like while I was speaking, he, I was like, oh, it's perfect. This will be great. She has one thing to do right now. It'll be perfect. He'll sleep. And that is totally not what happened. Like he didn't sleep. He wanted to eat. Um, but at the same time, like it was very positive for me to be able to have him there. I didn't get to meet as many people as I would. I didn't get any swag while I was there. I didn't, um, network as much. I didn't, one night I stayed home from the parties. Like the first night I was there, he literally stayed up all night just wanting to eat or like needing things because he's only he turned three months old the first day of the conference um so it was an experience um I don't know if I would recommend it or not recommend it but I'm glad that I had the support and the means because it's really expensive to have a nanny with you at a conference um but it was really cool to be able to have him there that's like a non-answer if ever there was one. No, that was an answer. And I'm so glad you touched on the reality because I'm a mom. And even when things go great, you and I both know that there are times in the day where you're struggling to meet certain commitments or do certain tasks, both big and small. And we got to watch you firsthand 
handle it with grace, I think, in a meet in a time where the nanny was not around. And so for you to hold your composure and be so brilliantly articulate about women in health IT while he was there with you and you're holding him, trying to console him, uh, was also something to behold. And I would not have known that you had not slept the night before and all these other things if we didn't stalk you on social media as a girl <laughs> health IT crush. But it was, it, yeah, I, I mean, you did a beautiful job balancing it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Like, it was just like, you know, babies are babies. And, and they always give you these inspirational speeches of people whose careers seem like they just seem so perfect. And I seriously still at the time, I was glad I got to speak and even glad I got to go with Naveen because it took a ton of planning on my part, but also like, it's so important to me to show, look, this isn't the reality. A lot of the times the conversations that we're having about women in health IT, I don't know who, what kind of step forward wife robots these women are, but they can handle a lot more than I can. It's clear. <laughs> so yeah, like it was pretty incredible. Like I, I love seeing everyone I know and I don't think I could have done it at any other conference, but there was so much on the back end, like, preparing with the nanny, preparing with everyone that I was working with, every single interview, preparing, um, even clothing. Like, I wanted to look decent so I could be on screen, but like, I haven't lost my baby weight, but also I'm breastfeeding. So like, there aren't very many formal dresses that you can wear to a cocktail hour that also like zip down in front so you can breastfeed your baby. Like, these are things that I hadn't really thought about because like when you're home, it doesn't matter. But if you're out, like, oh yeah, I have to plan an outfit that's also like breastfeeding friendly and all these other crazy things that I didn't think about planning. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, even just watching and seeing all of the other women, specifically at that particular meetup where you were speaking, at least where we got to see, it was nice to see the other women kind of coming in to help out and, you know, try to yeah. console baby Naveen while you were up on stage yeah and they were so nice and there were a lot of things i really felt strongly about like like in our work with utah hymns where we're trying to get more women involved and also where we're trying to like arrange events and i've been recruiting women to to speak more and and it's so interesting like there was a woman who asked about career advice and, and i still need to follow up with her but um i didn't get to like talk to as many women there but I was so grateful that even with the people who are on the panel with me, I know them and they were so nice. But also before the panel, I was talking to Dr. St. Clair and I was like, I'm surprising, I'm surprisingly a little bit resentful that I'm here. <laughs> like, like I knew I wanted to be there, but I also had that mom feeling, you know, people talk about mom guilt, but I had that mom feeling where I was just like, I just want to be with my baby today. Like, I don't want to talk to anyone. And those feelings, whether they're just hormones, they're real. And I was surprised both how great it was for me, the conference. Like, I, it was so amazing for me. Like, I got to meet so many women leaders and, and even just people that I know. But it also was harder because, you know, baby needed stuff. And I didn't feel like I was doing that. And I didn't get to talk to the people everyone that I wanted to. So, so it was kind of, kind of the mixed bag that is parenting, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think we pulled it off. Thanks. Yeah, well said, Joy. Thanks. And well I done, mean, Janae. We were supposed to talk more, but sorry, I was up all night. You know what? The, <laughs> oh, no, the like land, I said, the oh, part we observed, you were just, you were killing it, so. You're on really two important missions, you know, with the health IT work and the SHARP index. If you could snap your fingers and fix one problem in healthcare or health IT, what would it be and why? Oh my gosh, I didn't. If I could fix one problem in healthcare, besides interoperability, because that's what I thought at first, but um, I think it would be the mission of technology that right now, technology is perpetuating itself in systems instead of driving better health outcomes. 
like that would change our whole That's an interesting spin. measurement system. Like if we actually wanted technology to work for us, that'd be what I would immediately fix. Like if you could just snap your fingers and have the tech working for physicians, like working for medicine to cause healing. Like, so it's a really, it's probably maybe too high level. Like, you know, our OKR is off. Our, our main objective is off right now because we don't have one. We don't hold technology accountable. And, and that's a problem. Um, I also think interoperability would be cool. Like, what if we just had our data suddenly? I like the idea of the technology actually having a mission. I've never heard it stated that way before. But, you know, other folks have that we've been talking to have mentioned things like, you know, a lot, well, even in my conversations just with Robin, where we're talking, a lot of people have these great ideas for technology, but it's not necessarily solving a problem. Hey, that's fantastic that you had that great idea or you can get the technology to do something. But if it's not in context of the problem we're actually trying to solve, it's not really that <laughs> as helpful as it could be. So yeah. I like the idea of thinking intentionally before you create something, you know, how is this going to support the people who need it? Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I have to give credit because I kind of stole this idea, by the way. Um, like I sat down with Adrian Boise and we talked about health IT and their missions and just how, well, she didn't state it exactly how I did. Like she just said, if your health IT projects aren't directed towards our goals as an organization, reconsider them. Because like, I'm all about, I like shiny tech. Like I like cool code. Like I love cool health IT companies, but is it going the right direction? So I thought I should give her credit. I should give her credit. Partial credit. She gets partial credit. You know what? What did they say? Inspired by? That's yeah. Inspired by. <laughs> yeah. Just, so yeah. just think about that. Like just, I, I could just picture them at the Cleveland Clinic, like reviewing your health IT projects and being like, well, these are our organizational goals. Like, how are you doing with those? <laughs> and if your projects aren't directed towards your overall goals, cut them. Um, that's really important. That being said, I love, I mean, I like shiny tech. You know? <laughs> I'm not opposed to it, but if we could solve the problem where we're actually moving towards the goals, That'd be, that'd be big. So our third question that we're asking, this is our contribution to creating a Hit Like a Girl reading list. And so we're asking folks if they can share any books, blogs, anything in particular. It doesn't matter if you listened to it or actually read and highlighted it, but any, um, anything that has been impactful for you personally or professionally that you think others would benefit from. Oh, I have a big list. Should I send you an email? I can send you a giant one. One of them, um, I really care about like the health, healthcare and health tech creating greater equality. I like the book, Protecting the Health of the Poor. Um, I think that's important. And I'm just reading The Happy Human. Have you heard of that book? By Gopi Kalyani. No, Kalyani. not yet. No, tell us more about The Don't Happy Human. Like, yeah, like being real in an artificially intelligent world. I'm reading that right now. Um, I always tell people to read more about health equity. Um, the other thing I would recommend is the book Hyperbole and a Half, which is just a humor book. Can I recommend those? <laughs> because I think humor is a a key part of, of course. the survival world. Yes. Yeah. And so those are the three books I have on my dresser right now besides and, and next to them I have Grit which I just finished which is a great book by Angela Duckworth so those are the books I would recommend I've, I like little those are great. I like reading policy I like you know the data book podcast yeah those are some of the things I really really enjoy perfect that's um, super helpful I read a lot All right. that's where we started the healthcare IT book club yeah, where is that? I saw, is that part of the um, HC Reads? Is yeah, is that what it is? Like, yeah, we started that. And sometimes we just read articles because I realized not everybody could read a book in like a week, probably because they're not up all night with a baby, so they don't have as much time to read. 
but but yeah we we chat about them like I'm always open to more ideas like I have a bunch of books I'll read um and sometimes it's just articles but it's really cool to hear what other people read too in fact I had actually just recently come across uh your guys's twitter chat so how often are you guys reviewing books and talking about them online um so every week actually usually once a week once a month we skip a week but then every other week we have a chat we probably read one to two books and other than that it's like an article or like even a video that has relevant content and it's really just a club that we started of twitter chat of people who like to read which in healthy tea there are a ton of us we all love to read and it's tuesday nights at n- after hcldr at 9 30 p.m um it's really fun eastern got it i'm gonna add it to my calendar and recommend that our listeners check it out as well yeah awesome so janae yeah. if people want to find you online and i know that you know we follow you all online you're, you're like our twitter crush but can you for folks that um want to find you where could they get access to you on the social um, so yeah you could follow me on on twitter i'm at, at coherence med i also work with the health tech reads uh, handle and also sharp index and you could add me on linkedin i respond i respond on facebook i respond on <laughs> instagram <laughs> but yeah probably probably twitter is the best option Excellent. Well, thank you so much for letting us know about the mission you're on to end physician burnout and to learn a little bit more about you, Janae. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad we got to connect. Like, I love, I love your podcast and the work that you do, especially since it's so cool to see how many women are involved in health IT. Isn't it cool? I mean, we've been able to talk to so many people and, you know, we started out with releasing something every other Wednesday but but the rate at which we're talking to amazing women I'm thinking like oh we're gonna have to speed this up there's too many ladies out there that are so inspirational it's really cool yeah I I just think I've been so supported by women in health IT and even you saw that when I was speaking like those those women are so supportive and super smart and human and it just It makes me happy that I'm involved in this industry. And thank you for listening to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. If you want to know more about us or this guest, check out our website at hitlikeagirlpod.com. While you're at it, if you found value in this episode, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or simply tell a friend. You can also connect with us on Twitter or Instagram at the handle hitlikeagirlpod. Thanks again. See you soon. Oh,